Dr. Landry, thanks so much for being with me today. My pleasure. Can you talk a little bit about your tweet that you made? You said that doctors shouldn't have to get excited about technology. It should be just be something that runs in the background. I was curious what you meant by that. Okay, well, it, was, it wasn't actually my quote. It, I think it was from Eric Dishman, but I think it is important that um, in the era of big data and of precision medicine, uh, the relationship between patients or the public and doctors or doctors and medical staff is, is as important as it ever was. That's the human face, that's the human interchange. So when I go to clinic on a Wednesday morning and I see cardiology patients in Oxford, it's that, it's that exchange that happens. What I actually ha I'm doing behind the scenes is calculating using my experience to uh, bring the, the body of knowledge and experience that I have to treat a particular uh, patient to make decisions. What I think big data can do uh, and the era, era of precision medicine can do is to do a lot of that work for me. Mm. Uh, so that actually the, the, the calculations, the uh, acquisition of the knowledge uh, and the interpretation could be presented to me in a, in a simple format. Mm. It's a little bit like thinking of a pilot who's flying a, a jet plane. They, they, there's a lot of complicated electronics in there, a lot of complicated engineering, but all that sensor information, all that uh, uh, mechanics is happening in the background. What they actually see in front of them are some fairly simple displays, mm. and it's those simple displays that allow them to make the decisions to actually get us from one airport to the other, uh, hopefully without any hazard. And so I think actually that what the technology needs to be doing for us is uh, acquiring large amounts of data, interpreting those data, and presenting them back in, in ways that means for something us as the consumers and the consumers in this case are the clinical staff the people providing healthcare, and they're the patients and the public the consum consumers of that ad of that advice dr landry you also work to help streamline clinical trials can you speak a little bit about why that's so important big data largely can give you an understanding about patterns uh, and about um, uh, associations and uh, between diseases and particular behaviors or particular genetics. What one really wants to understand about causality and in particular how should I act? Given all these results, how should I actually treat a particular patient? And for that actually it's, it's more complicated and in some ways actually randomization, randomized trials which we've been doing for well over 50 years uh, are a way of uh, dealing with all the background noise and understanding exactly whether intervening with treatment A is better than intervening with treatment B. Now, one of the things that's been, uh, been challenging over all these years has been the rising cost of clinical trials. Mm. Uh, and it's not unheard of for a large-scale clinical trial, late-phase clinical trial, to cost half a billion dollars. That's crazy. It is crazy. Mm. And it doesn't need to cost half a billion mm. dollars. I know that because we, we do them for about a tenth of that cost. Wow. Same trial, probably a bit larger, and we do it for a tenth of the money. How do you do that? Well, it's really streamlining it back to, back to basics. It's um, what I would call, if you like, quality by design. You work out what are the critical features that matter for the patients that are in the study, to inform them and to look after their care, to make sure those patients are safe. And what's the critical data that you need to have, the critical processes to make sure you, that you actually get reliable results. Hmm. And you focus on those things and you remove the accessories. Can you, you have to do- Can you explain an example of something that you might not be that important that you could trim? Well, there's a lot of emphasis put on, for example, clinical trial monitoring, okay. individual checking of data points. Now, my current trial is 30,000 people in 10 countries wow. with a five year, four or five years of follow-up. If I had to check every individual data point uh, in detail by, as it's traditionally done, sending staff to a site to compare one piece of paper with another piece of paper, not actually knowing whether either piece of paper is right, sure. this is an extraordinarily expensive way of doing things. And it would take forever. And it takes, yeah. for, it takes forever. Whereas in fact, what if I use statistical approaches and say, look, of all the data I'm collecting, can I see unusual patterns in the data that I'm collecting, which might indicate that a particular member of staff at a particular site is not performing as well, perhaps because they don't understand the procedures as well as they should do. Or that perhaps a particular process isn't working, perhaps a particular machine isn't working as well as it should do. Can I use the data to actually help me uh, understand uh, the patterns, the errors that are, that are occurring? Now that can vastly uh, reduce the costs and actually improve the quality. Can you fast forward maybe 10 years into the future? What questions would you like to see answered using data? The big challenges that we're facing at the moment, uh, the big new challenges, I think there's a whole area around infection. It's not my field, but I think particularly antimicrobial resistance. I think there's a huge area around dementia and cognitive mm. decline. 
that's a big data problem. Perhaps that's, if I had to choose one, perhaps that's the one I'd choose. Why is it a big data problem? Well, we know there are rising numbers of people getting de dementia. Secondly, we know that by the time people have dementia, actually most of the actions happened. What's one that, what, if one does brain imaging or tries to intervene with drugs, one's acting essentially on scar tissue. It's too late. It's too late. So, uh, in fact, as was shown at this conference earlier today, some of the early changes that are associated with later cognitive decline and then dementia occur perhaps in the 20s or the 30s or the 40s, but the actual impact doesn't happen until the 70s or the 80s. So it's a big data problem in that you've got time to deal with, decades, sure. and you've got scale to deal with. You've got to deal with the detailed imaging to actually understand exactly what the brain processes are. You've got to under, be able to assess the different dimensions of cognitive ability. You've got to also be able to, to assess the social dimensions. What's the impact on the healthcare system? What's the impact on the economy? But most importantly, what's the impact on the patient and their family? Now, those are big data problems. Um, uh, whether we will have cracked those in 10 years, I think would be optimistic, but I'd like us to see uh, substantial progress in that direction. Well, it's certainly an area to focus on. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.